Okay, so I was going to start out by talking about um, what I view as current trends in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And so there's been a, obviously a, a huge amount of hype around machine learning and what, what people call AI. And, and, and my, my own perspective is I, I tend to work on, on science and then lately policy questions. And so I, I've seen a lot of kind of weaknesses um, in what most people are doing. And this has bled over beyond the kind of core machine learning community to other people doing kind of data science methodology, like people in statistics, are kind of focusing largely on these kind of tech type problems. And I'll, I'll talk about that in the first part. And, th and then I'll, I'll, I'll raise this question about, well, what, what about science applications and policy applications? Uh, maybe these kind of core machine learning methods that people are, that most of the community is working on uh, don't work so well in those types of settings, and we need to think about um, certain issues carefully. Um, and and I'll, I'll describe two things in, in, in detail, a um, little bit of detail. Um, the one is uh, an application to fairness in criminal justice, um, and the other is to a, a scientific application to uh, neuroscience looking at relationships between um, the brain connectome and, and human traits. Okay, so what is machine learning? And so I, 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 I had a, a perception that this is kind of a broad audience. Um, I'm sure some of you, uh, many of you work on machine learning, but, but bear with me. Okay, so what is machine learning to me? Okay, so it's trying to answer the question of can we design algorithms to sort of learn from the data um, targeted to specific tasks? And there's, there's a, a type, of type of task that we tend to work on a lot in designing machine learning algorithms or a sort of narrow set of tasks. And it's not really learning, I would say, in the traditional sense in which a child or student may learn from experience. And, and so it's somewhat of, of a, mis a misnomer. A lot of people could say machine learning is just really, it's just really statistics. You're taking data, you're trying to predict something or, or, or do some automated task, um, classification of an image, et cetera. So you have data in and then you, you automatically do that, whatever that task is. Um, so the focus is typically on, on algorithms for very specific tasks and classes of, of, of algorithms. And so you're, you're trying to develop a class of algorithms to, to solve a type of task. So it, it's similar to the field of statistics in that sense, but um, it, it differs um, very substantially, I'd say, culturally and in the types of problems that people work on. Okay, so some example ML questions that people have worked on a lot is so can we define a, a classifier to output the type of objects in an image? And so we might have, you know, a Google type problem or we have lots of natural images, pictures of scenery, pictures of um, what's occurring in the environment and we'd like to automatically say, well, what, what's in that image? Is there a car? Is there a car of a particular type? Is there a, a suitcase? Is there a cat? Whatever, what's in the image? Um, can we automatically label a document with a, a keyword or summary? That's a kind of related problem. And so we might imagine we have some training data where we've put down labels and now we want to take that document and, and automatically give it a summary. Uh, can we place ads on web pages to maximize uh, so a click through rate to make the company um, some, some revenue? Okay. Can, can we convert audio recordings of, of talking into text? Um, can we de design an algorithm for a self-driving car? That's been very, very um, popular in the news lately. A lot of interest in that. Okay, so, th so these are kind of canonical, I would say. This types of, these types of questions are kind of canonical machine learning questions um, that, that would be very different from scientific questions or policy questions, clearly. Um, okay, so what do we do then? Well, I would say that in general, machine learning algorithms are only as good as the, the data being, being fed into the algorithm. And that's a, a somewhat of a, a theme of the talk. Yeah. Um, and so, so really a key to addressing those types of questions that I, I just described is to have a lot of high quality training data. Um, and so that's been one of the um, real improvements in recent years in machine learning algorithms is due to clever ways to engineer and design and produce um, large training data sets. Uh, the training data sets are often obtained from humans, and so you can think that, oh, we want a machine learning algorithm. Maybe there's some task a human is doing, and humans are pretty good at a lot of tasks. They're certainly good at looking at a picture and telling you what's in the picture. Pretty good at driving cars. Um, they would be pretty good at reading a document and then summarizing the document or giving keywords of the document or giving the topics of the document. They're, they're good at these types of things. And so often a human would be viewed as a gold standard Okay, and if we, could, if we could just mimic the human accurately, then we would be doing amazing. 
I think. And then up, up until recently, this would maybe be unachievable, but now it's maybe, maybe getting pretty close for certain types of machine learning algorithms, which is pretty cool. Though I would, there, as kind of a, um, you know, humans are not good at making sense of scientific data. <laughs> so so that, that, that's a limitation there. Okay, so they're very good at these other types of problems. They're very good at listening to an audio recording and, and saying what, writing down what the people said in that audio recording. Okay, so, so their labels in these types of mach canonical machine learning applications, the, the, the human labels can be viewed as a gold standard. Okay, so some examples of labeled data. So you might use something like Mechanical Turk. You might try to get human volunteers to label images or summarize the content ten of documents um, through some sort of crowdsourcing. Um, we can get lots of labels cheaply. You know, some of the people labeling might be crappy, but you might automatically figure out which ones the crappy ones are and then throw them out of the, uh, of the training data auto automatically. Um, if you're doing um, automatic uh, self-driving cars, it would be very easy to get a, a really a lot of uh, training data. There's obviously people driving cars all over the place. We can just put monitors in the car, and we can get just an absurd amount of training data of cars driving under different conditions. Um, in medical applications, people have gotten excited about uh, doing automatic image processing of things like uh, um, MRI images or trying to look at a, an, an image and decide whether there's breast cancer or trying to look at a EKG or some heart, heart rhythm and then decide whether there's a particular type of problem. You could get a bunch of expert radiologists and they can classify a bunch of um, images or signals and, and then we could use that as training data. That's been being, being done all, all the time now. Uh, another thing that got a lot of, lot of press that I found really interesting with this kind of whole AlphaGo thing where you, you can de design, well then now we can have an intelligent machine because it can play a game really well like chess or Go. Um, and this is another case where, where we can get a lot of labeled data. And that was one reason for, I think, the success of, of automatic um, game playing is that you can initially start, start out with a data set of humans playing games. And then you can just have computers play against each other like billions of times and then generate an enormous amount of, of training data um, telling you, you know, what type of strategies work, um, et cetera. And so you can cheaply. Um, generate a lot of data. And it, it was kind of a funny anecdote in some sense is that I, I'm sort of kind of mostly a statistician, but I have like a foot in the machine learning world. And a lot of my friends are machine learning people. And uh, the, every, they got very excited about this whole um, AlphaGo, the kind of machine that could beat the Go champion. And Go was thought to be much more complicated than, than chess and much more difficult to design a, a computer to, um, to play Go effectively. Okay, and so it beat the kind of world Go champion, and then they got very excited, and they said, we should stop playing games. We should kind of solve um, big problems like genomics or personalized medicine, and I was just like so annoyed. I just kind of hid them on Facebook and couldn't look at them anymore because the problems are completely different. The, the, in this type of problem, we can generate an absurd amount of training data very easily. In genomics, what am I doing? I, well, I'm, I would like to look at somebody's genome there's a big, they have a big genome, and I would like to predict um, what diseases they're going to get, um, what medicines they're going to respond to um, if they get a particular disease, um, what type of preventive strategies are going to work well. And I have almost no labeled data, and I have an enormously like, absurd number of features. And so I'm sort of in the opposite regime. And um, yeah, so, so uh, methods that are effective when you have tons of training data when you can generate hundreds of millions of labeled data or games um, that are not going to be effective in this kind of medical science where you have high, high dimensional, low sample size type data. Internet browsing behavior, we also have like a just absolute ton of that. And um, an example of that is uh, I, I have a friend, Deepak Agrawal, who, who works in, in tech. And he were, at the time, he worked for Yahoo. And, and they, Yahoo at the time was the most visited, their front page was the most visited website in the world. And, and people would go on there and then there would be articles, these key articles they would click on, like human interest articles. And they used to have like a team of like English majors and stuff and sociologists and they would sit there and they would try to talk about what articles to put up there. And so he suggested, well, give me like a little bit of the flow 
and I'll just design a sort of um, adaptive algorithm to figure out what people click on, and we'll just put up what people click on. And they, they, it totally changed that people are much more vapid in, um, than, than, than they thought. You know, they <laughs> might be some article, like popular article about some sort of pop star. Um, and, and so they put that up there, or cats or some cat videos. Um, and so they put that up there, and it, it increased the click-through rate at, at, Yahoo, at this website by 30% which given the amount of traffic made the company uh, something like $200 million a year. Um, that one change uh, just using kind of a machine learning algorithm instead of just um, human intuition and experience. I guess. So, um, so you can have a big, big impact uh, using these types of machine learning algorithms in that sense, making money anyway. OK, so what about mimicking automating humans? And so, um, so much of ML, I would say, focuses on treating humans as, a, as gold standards. Um, if we can just mimic or automate human performance in specific tasks, we've done amazing. Um, and the algorithms are going to be trained to some specific tasks or context. Um, one, one important thing to note is that, that most of these types of algorithms, essentially all of these machine learning algorithms, they have, have really no ability to do well in other contexts other than which they were trained. And so the, you're not, it's not like a human or a, an actually intelligent robot where if you were trained um, in, in some context, then you could kind of look to other contexts and you could extrapolate or interpolate kind of intelligently. Um, in general, these algorithms are, are really kind of just dependent very much on the training data context. And so if you go to another context, because you're not really learning underlying pack, patterns and mechanisms, you're just trying to come up with something that can mimic the data in some sense, that, then you don't have that ability. Um, and so certainly, though, this is not a negative talk about machine learning. I think definitely it's been really exciting how this kind of abundance of huge label da data sets, computing power, and, and cool algorithms have like revolutionized ML and, and in these types of applications. OK, so what about deep learning? I'm sure most of the people have heard about deep learning. And so um, there's been a lot of hype around this um, and, and its success in tech industry applications. So I'll give an example. Um, so, so machine learning tends to be a very trendy field. Um, so I, I work largely in, in a, one of my areas is Bayesian nonparametrics. And say back in about 2010, it was a trendy area of machine learning. And then, then deep learning kind of takes off. Um, and now people are working on these kind of neural nets, deep learning a lot more than, 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 um, than, than Bayesian, Bayesian methods and Bayesian nonparametrics. And if, if you become adept at these types of methods, say you're kind of working on new types of ways to do um, uh, neural networks and, and scale them up to different types of problems or, or modify the methodology and you get a PhD in that, then in the US you might commonly start an industry in over 300,000 um, US dollars per year like starting salary now. And so that, that's, that's gone up a lot. I'd say probably back in 2010 that was probably, you know, if you're lucky, a uh, thir third of that or maybe a, maybe, maybe a half um, if you're a Michael Jordan student. Um, OK, so, so this is particularly one of the most popular and successful classes of algorithms by far is deep learning. Um, and it, it's definitely a rebranding of neural networks. So the essential model has been around for, for decades, really. The, and it, it's had little, little modifications. Okay. And so the, the game in neural networks is to learn the relationship between some, some type of input an input and some output. And this is a non-deep neural network. So you have some hidden layer, you have inputs, and they're kind of going into these hidden layers, and then you're doing some sort of nonlinear transformation, and then you get some output. Okay. So in, in deep learning, you have many, many, many layers. You might have even 30 or 50 layers. Okay. And, and you have a lot of parameters then, because your data are the inputs, maybe the outputs, and you don't have data on anything in between or any of these links or anything like that. So they're, they're extremely flexible at modeling any sort of input-output relationship in a broad variety of, of domains. Um, they might involve millions of unknown parameters that can be estimated from data and, and tuned for good performance in particular settings. Um, and so, so essentially, they're most useful as a black box mapping from inputs to outputs, which is the nature of most machine learning, really. You want to you wanna predict something. And so you have some input data or features or something. And you want to predict based on that. You don't really want to do inferences, most, almost never in machine learning. You want to do predictions. Okay. 
So you don't care that, it might be that, you know, estimating this kind of link right here, you don't care about that. You just care about the input-output relationship. If you did care about that, you're not going to be able to do that very well anyway, and then you're going to be getting something very unreliable. Okay. Um, it's quite complicated, and the parameters are not interpretable or reliably estimated. So in statistical lingo, uh, you would have not, not very good identifiability of these individual parameters in the neural network. But in terms of the functional relationship overall, you might have quite good performance. Um, and then I remember when, when I was a grad student and early on in my career, neural networks were like a joke. You know, like it, the people stopped using those a long time ago. And you try them, and they were like terrible. Um, because they were they they were hor horribly overfit the data. They would chase individual data points. Um, they would be not completely a black box. It's not interpretable. And so, how useful is that? Um, and they would be pretty computationally intractable and unstable. Okay, as well. And so, it's been kind of, we're quite interesting how um, how that's sort of completely changed l lately. I mean, maybe not some of the issues are still there. Maybe, but. Um, the, certainly, the popularity of neural networks and their success in certain applications has changed a lot. Um, so this is the t typical um, hype curve. Like, you have some technology, and then everyone's like really excited. And then they're like, well, actually, it doesn't work that well. And then you kind of improve it again. Um, but I, I'd say three factors, in my, my view, have improved the performance and popularity of neural networks and, and deep learning in recent years. Um, the one is, again, the, the availability of these huge labeled data sets. And so if we have millions of parameters, but I have hundreds of millions of labeled data, then OK, well, as long as I can figure out the computational problem, maybe I'm OK. Particularly if I don't care about those parameters, I might be able to more robustly estimate an input-output relationship than the actual latent structure in between. Um, Obviously, we've had huge, huge, huge improvement in computing and access to many computers in a network. And we can, we can chew on much bigger problems computationally. Um, and, and I think one of the biggest reasons is the amazing engineering, uh, really incredible engineering of software and algorithms and things like TensorFlow. Because now somebody can go in. I remember I was talking to my friends in tech, and he was tra trained at Duke as a kind of Bayesian guy who would do sampling and all this stuff. And, He's like, oh, neural networks, I should figure this out. He goes into TensorFlow, and like in an hour or two, it's like, oh, it's not that hard. It's pretty easy to figure it out. And then he's kind of going, going with it by the end of the day, you know, um, and try, trying it out. You can tune it. Um, you know, somebody can be quite a novice and jump in there, and it's quite well engineered and fast and nice. And so that, that's really um, a, a statement in general. If we're designing algorithms, we could, sh should really design it in a way that people can use it and try it out and play with it. And also, the, the, the automatic differentiation and the improvements in automatic differentiation um, within TensorFlow has really been, been amazing, I think. OK, so these have, these have led to, to incredible improvements in the types of problems I mentioned above. OK, skip that. OK, so what about the limitations? So, um, so before getting into this sort of science and policy domain, I'll just talk about some other limitations and, and cutting through the hype a bit. Because there's been a lot of hype in the, the, gen, in the press, and, and the general public are worried about like robots taking over the world and things like that. And we'll look at the amazing advances in, in, in artificial intelligence. Um, but I, I think that um, Mike Jordan had a recent kind of interview on this as well. And, and, he said that, well, neural networks are not at all a solution to this artificial intelligence problem. They get us no closer to artificial intelligence. They're not really learning. They're not a model of the human brain. Um, they, um, yeah, they aren't AI. And so AI is still not really that much farther along. Though uh, you can imagine that if we kind of put a really fast computer in some robot's brain, and we tried to, we're, we're trying to get it to do certain tasks, um, it might be pretty good. Maybe it's a drone and it's trying to shoot people or something. You probably could get it pretty good at something like that. But it's not, it's not true, true intelligence in some sense. OK, but it's just sort of summarizing an input-output relationship from a big data set. And they, they suck at generalizing beyond the specific context in which they're trained. OK. So the self-driving cars is one example. And so people have been. That's been, been, been a lot of news and hype about that. And so they worry that the sort of lack of reasoning and generalizability might create problems in the self-driving cars domain or other similar domains. 
So, so if you have a situation that's different than in the training data, you're kind of screwed. And so humans can kind of adapt to that. You could imagine that if we did the following, if we just took, took a bunch of cars and, and we had a bunch of drivers, they're pretty good drivers, and we train, we train the algorithm on a lot of um, driving in good conditions, then if all of a sudden in, in the, we use that algorithm and then we went to, okay, well now there's like an ice storm or something, the, 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 um, the human driver would do dramatically better than the kind of deep neural network trained machine learning algorithm at adapting to those different situations, um, dramatically better. And so um, if you're going to program a self-driving car, certainly you need to put, um, kind of dream up what all these unanticipated situations are. There's some strange accident in front of you or bad road conditions or weird weather or other bad drivers who are texting on their phone or something. You need to kind of put that in the training data or, or your car is not going to be very good at, at dealing with these kind of weird situations that we all run into in driving. Okay. Or you've trained it in a good situation and then you throw, the, throw the, the algorithm in like Los Angeles or something, which is a horrible driving situation. Okay. The car won't know how to react to these situations. Um, but I'd say that in the car case, this is solvable. I think that we're actually going to have good self-driving um, cars um, because we can just we can we should be able to be put in all of this to the extent possible weird conditions into the training data. We just need to think carefully about that. Um, and so I think that getting accidents rates significantly low, lower than human drivers is I would conjecture not not that difficult. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing is that this, the people are kind of a bit un, irrational in some sense, that you're like, Uber is amazingly popular. And so you get these kind of weird Uber drivers. Um, and so I think that we can beat you know, the, the average Uber driver using some machine learning algorithm, you know, trained properly, good machine learning algorithm, in terms of the accident rate. But if there's a, an occasional accident with a human Uber driver, people don't freak out at all. But if like Tesla's you know, um, self-driving car has an accident, then they're like freaking out and they never want to buy the car again and the company crashes. And so it's kind of weird how that works. It's sort of a, a strange um, thing that we kind of hold the computer to a, a much higher bar than we give a, a, a human um, in that sense. We put our hands in, the, uh, our, our fate in the hands of another human before we would a computer even if it had much lower accident rates. Okay, so what, what creates really critical problems for deep learning? And we can think about how that then creates problems if we're going outside of these types of applications that I've been talking about. Um, limited or biased training data. And so there's been some really disasters where you think, oh, well, the algorithm is not really, it's fair, it's not biased. It's like, it just takes the data, just reflecting the data. Well, that can be a disaster because a lot of the data is actually sort of biased. It's reflecting selection biases in the processes in which we collected data, which then if we train the algorithm based on that data, it's going to be mimicking those biases, okay, which can be potentially a disaster. Um, settings in which humans can't perform well and we are not simply trying to automate human performance. I'd say that um, that's like most of problems, really. But these specialized problems in tech, that's why I put the beyond tech in the title. These specialized problems in tech are usually settings in which a human can do well. They just, you don't have enough manpower and time for the human to do well. But if, if you did, then they would do well. Um, learning mechanisms underlying relationships in the data. So if we, if we don't want just a black box that can predict something, but we want to know what's going on physically or scientifically or sociologically, um, then that's not going to do very well. And I, I've heard a lot of really bad deep learning talks where they tried to do this. They like fit some deep learn neural network and say, oh, we want to do interpretable machine learning. And then they'll like estimate the parameters in the neural network um, using a Bayesian method or something. And then of course it's like completely unreliable and still uninterpretable. So it, it's a bit, um, it's a bit, a bit, bit dodgy. So uh, in general, um, most machine learning ma algorithms are not good at learning these mechanisms. Uh, providing results that are easily interpretable, and characterizing uncertainty in learning relationships and data. And that's really, really key, is a, a good characterization of uncertainty if you're going to be doing something like science. Um, looking for evidence for or against hypotheses. And so um, it, it's been interesting because like hypothesis testing is almost like a dirty word, but that's mostly what people do in science. I have some hypothesis about some 
something about the world or some physical relationship or some biologic relationship and I'd like to get some data and to see whether those data are like consistent with a hypothesis or not. And then if not, then maybe I'd like to refine my hypotheses. So that's sort of how science goes. Um, and, and machine learning kind of sucks at all of these things. Can't deal with them. And deep learning is my, my kind of stereotypical machine learning algorithm. Okay, so let's get into some more of the nuts and bolts about science and policy. Um, so first science and then policy. Okay, so, so in science applications, and science is obviously very broad, I would say that, um, that interestingly, even people in academic departments who work on machine learning or statistics or data science, most of the intellectual energy in the, in the field of the broad field of data science has been on industry type problems, these types of problems I mentioned, men, mentioned above. And so we end up working on, on methods that are not really appropriate for science, scientific problems often. Um, so the, the problems are fundamentally different in science. In, in science, we tend to collect more and more complicated data. So we get, there's been amazing advances in sensor technology and ways to monitor people and, and get more information on biomarkers and the, where, wear devices and get more information on, on their gut bacteria and all sorts of things. And so we end up with this like amazingly complicated giant data on each individual or each lab rat or whatever, and we'd like to know, well, well how, does, how do this different information relate to um, characteristics of the, of the subject, okay, for example. We'd like to test scientific hypotheses. And so this is incredibly difficult with this giant data. Um, we don't want a black box. And so if we have a black box to predict, I would say even if we're in a setting where you think that you would want a black box, like, oh, a patient comes in, to, um, to the clinic and you would like to predict what, what disease they have or what condition they have. They have a set of symptoms, you enter the symptoms into your black box and it spits out, oh, it looks like they have this condition. Well, doctors don't really want that. They want to know, well, why, well what is it doing? Um, they, they don't trust it if it's just a black box. So you, you, you really want to know um, how the box works. Um, most of the whole point is to use data to test hypotheses, learn new unanticipated relationships, and improve understanding of mechanisms. And so, so the, these kind of black box machine learning algorithms, whatever they are, deep learning, random forest, whatever, they don't do that. Okay, so an example I'm going to get back to um, at the end of the talk that I've been working on a ton and I'm really excited about is, is human brain connectomics, okay? This stuff is totally cool, I think. So this is like, um, this is one person's brain. Okay, and so you can put them in, in various types of MRI machines and, um, and, and estimate the individual brain, structural brain connectome. And so your brain is broken up into different, into gray matter and white matter. So in the white matter, we have all these neurons, okay, and they're tightly bundled together in, in this, uh, along these white matter tracks. And you can think of the white matter tracks as like a wire, and there's all these wires in your brain, and your brain is set up as like a circuit or something. So there's all these wires in the brain, and so here's every little curve in this plot, and this is like looking at the, the head from the side, is one of these wires. And if we, if we zoom in and we look at connections, structural connections between two brain regions, these are all, all the little wires, or white matter tracks, okay, that we've picked up from the imaging. And we can do that, we can get uh, a picture like that for like everyone in the audience, you can imagine, or everyone in a big study, and then we could also get traits of them, like does the person tend to be depressed? Are they like super brilliant at topology? Are they like really creative? Or um, do they have anxiety? And then we can relate the brain structure to those traits, okay, potentially. But then that's your, that's your data after preprocessing is like over a million little curves snaking through the three-dimensional brain, okay? So how the hell, what do we do with that? Um, we have lots of qu problems like that in science, where you have complicated, really big data. You're not going to have 10,000 or million patients in your study. You might have 1,000 in a huge study. And you, you would like to use that 1,000 patients to relate something like this to traits of the individual, or neuropsychiatric diseases, et cetera. Okay. Um, and so um, there's a, a couple of really amazing data sets like this that are publicly available, if any of you guys want to get into this cool stuff. Is, um, one is the Human Connectome Project. And so we have, we can, we, and we have a new way to pre-process, but we can get pictures like this for 
over a thousand different in individuals, and we've also they've also measured lots of different traits of those same individuals. And I'll show some some cool results um, later on. Um, and so, can we use these data to improve understanding of relationships between brain structure and traits or diseases? This is a kind of scientific question, I think. Okay, so I'll get back to that later. So, what what about policy? So, I would just say. Usual machine learning algorithms can't deal with this type of thing at all. What about policy? So um, there's a lot of interest in using machine learning algorithms to automate decision making. And so if we're making decisions about something that's really important to people's lives, you can imagine that there's a lot of bias in the decision maker. Okay? And so you, we would like to somehow maybe remove the bias in the decision maker by using a computer to to give you an unbiased decision that maybe then human decision makers look at and then modify or evaluate. Okay, and one, one context that we've been working on a lot, and um, I have a, my collaborator, main collaborator is our Christian Lum, um, who works on human rights, and James, James Jandra at Stanford. And the interest there is, is, is doing fairness in criminal justice, in the criminal justice system. And so you have somebody coming in, and they, they are being tr um, tried for some offense. Maybe they've had, maybe it's assault and battery, or maybe it's possession of, of certain types of drugs. And they're in front of the judge, and the judge is setting bail on that individual. Or the judge is, is, might give them a, a sentence to that individual. Okay? Maybe individual A is African American, low income kid, and individual B is a Caucasian, upper middle class kid. Okay, is the judge, the judge maybe has some implicit bias. We'd like to remove, ideally remove that and, and give a fair decision that removes the influence of race. Okay, so that's one example. Um, so we'd like to remove these human biases and prejudices. Also in, in um, what's called predictive policing. So we'd like to be efficient about um, distributing um, law enforcement to different areas to police those areas. Um, the, the, you could imagine that one might say, oh, let's just go to these kind of, in the US, and cities, often minority, African American, Hispanic um, neighborhoods, they have more crime, and let's just look there. And so then you go off and look there, and then you see more crimes because you're looking there, and there's this feedback loop where the machine learning algorithm just keeps looking more and more and more in a kind of uh, unfair way. And it's, it's, of course, difficult to define fair. But, but that's the kind of game. I would also uh, add environmental risk assessment. There's, there's all this thing, like in the US, we now have this um, quite interesting director of the Environmental Protection Agency who's trying to remove a lot of the, um, um, and so you would, you would hope that some, if we could get an amazing machine learning algorithm, you could, you could kind of scrape a bunch of data on climate change and the effects of various pollutants from automobiles, et cetera, and you could put it in and, and in, in an objective way um, say what the effect is. OK, and so in these cases, it's very clear, also in science cases, questions of data quality and selection bias are really, really, really important. Like, how, how are your data that you're using to train the algorithm selected into the, into the sample? OK, now you train the algorithm, and, and it has all these selection bias, has racial bias in it, or you've cherry-picked the studies that you're putting in to your um, environmental risk, automated environmental risk assessment algorithm that then the biases are going to be in the algorithm, and then it's not going to be fair at all or impartial at all. It's going to be reproducing the biases in your data and sometimes magnifying them. OK, so we need, um, we need I would say that we need machine learning methods that are carefully targeted to the problem of interest. Um, we can't be agnostic to the data collection process. Um, and there's been a, a number of disasters, I would say, and there's a potential for really big disasters. So one, one example um, I would say is one of the potentials for disasters is applying um, machine learning and d deep learning is just one example to medical record data. So there, there's for long, many, many years has been this field of biostatistics where sort of statisticians carefully figure out how to analyze biomedical data. And now we have um, automatic collection of lots of healthcare records. And so people flooded in this kind of healthcare data science or healthcare machine learning field and I see often that people will um, kind of naively come in and they're like, oh, they just take all this data from the medical records and now I want to predict some, some outcome. 
okay? And then you look at what they've done and they're like, well, they, they don't account for like the, the time ordering of events or one of your features is actually, this happens all the time, really. <laughs> um, so the, the, the patient gets, has some conditions, diagnosed with some condition at some time. The data that you're looking at the patient is, is, is from this time. After the patient's diagnosed, well, they're treating that disorder with various things and they have codes that they've been diagnosed with and, and so they'll take features from this whole region and predict this and they're like, oh, my machine learning algorithm is like 99% accurate in predicting this disease that everyone knows is like, there's no way you can predict that accurately because it's so variable. I mean, people are doing this stuff all the time. So um, whereas, you know, there's biased statisticians, they're maybe conservative and they're like thinking about ordering and survival and censoring and selection bias and formative censoring and all these things. And, and then the machine learning people swoop by them and grab a bunch of data and then are predicting garbage because they, they don't. So I, I think there needs to be something in between. But certainly we need, to, we need to think carefully about the context of which those data are collected or that's a clear case where there's like selection bias. If, you're, if you have one of your features you're using to predict a time to event outcome occurs after the event, then your method's bullshit. <laughs> um, Prediction for recidivism risk based on arrest data is another really you know, the example I just gave on um, predictive policing. Okay, so um, yeah. Okay, so let's go into a little bit into the weeds of just a simple algorithm for this kind of machine learning and policy um, fairness application, and then I'll and then I'll I'll, I'll give an application in science, and then and then you'll be done listening to me. Okay. Um, so machine learning, this is really a hot area. And then I'd say really Christian Lum got me working on this. And she's really one of the world leaders in this area. Um, and she works for a human rights um, organization based, based in, the, um, in Silicon Valley. OK, so we'd like to increasingly employ machine learning to assist human decision makers. It's true in a lot of settings. And so it might be sentencing. Hiring has been a really, really popular example lately because um, People keep doing these sociological studies where they'll, um, they'll, they'll have two CVs, and then you want, you want to get an interview. OK, that's the outcome interview. You have two CVs. The one CV will be, they'll be exactly identical, but the one CV will have like a traditionally African-American name in the US. You know? They'll be like Khalid, and then they'll be like Jim Smith. <laughs> um, and so Khalid Mohammed and Jim Smith have the same CV, and then you send them in. You send in to different companies, and then like uh, Jim Smith gets massively more interviews. There was a study like that. Okay. Um, there was a recent one that came out um, that was really interesting um, that my, my wife is getting up all and up, up, up in arms about, but where it was uh, instead of um, ethnic or racial bias, it was uh, gender bias. And they, they, they would have um, women or, or men with a variety of CVs. And so they're both white names or whatever. And, and they have a variety of CVs. And they're looking for these kind of quite good jobs. And, and the, what they found is that if the woman like went to Harvard and had a 4.0, they didn't really want to hire her. She's like too smart or something. <laughs> and, but if the guy went to Harvard and had a 4.0, they hire her. They wanted to hire the woman. Maybe, maybe if she went to Harvard, if she had a 3.4, they would rather hire that person than the one with a 4.0. And so it was really interesting, actually. There was this huge biases shown by these kind of, now probably people will start to pick up on this, but kind of sending out fake CVs and seeing who gets the interview. Okay. Um, it's pretty compelling. And so maybe if we, were, if we were doing hiring or college admissions, which are also super biased and weird, maybe we can automate some of that uh, in a careful way, which adjusts for biases then maybe we can remove them. If we just take the existing data, past hiring, um, we have a big data set on how people have hired in the past, and we train on that, then that's not going to work at all, obviously. That's just going to re re reproduce the biases that are obviously there. Um, so the reason for using ML is the perceived neutrality of computers. Um, but there's a growing realization that if you just naively use machine learning algorithms to automate decisions, then it doesn't really improve fairness. That, that the data sets that are out there, like on the web and other places, are very, very biased. OK, so the biases uh, are in the training data can even be amplified by the machine learning algorithm. And so the machine learning algorithm can be even worse than a human who was somewhat biased, but trying to look not that biased. 
Okay, so, um, so what we were trying to interested in, and, and James and um, John Drew and Christian Lum have a, a paper, I think, coming out in Annals of Applied Statistics, and we just uh, both got a grant um, together um, from the Arnold Foundation to work on these type of methods. And, and so what we'd like to do is we'd like to take a data set that ha it had a bunch of features. Well, maybe one of the features is like gender, or African American, ethnicity, or Hispanic, whatever. And we would like to kind of purify the data set so that if we, if we fit a machine learning algorithm to do prediction of some outcome, like um, whether there was a, another offense within two years, um, then, then that, that, that wouldn't be racially biased, for example. Okay. So you could put, then we could take your purified data, we could stick it in any machine learning algorithm, and there would be some sort of guarantees of fairness. Okay, so we, we had a simple approach. I don't want to get into technical details of anything, but, um, but I just like one slide with some math. So we were removing a sensitive covariate Z. If we just remove it, let's say, what's the naive approach? Okay, well, I have a, a bunch of data, a recidivism data set, and we have a bunch of these data sets now. We're going to get a really int super interesting one. Um, there's all these legal ramifications, like the bail bondsmen don't, don't want us to have the data and stuff, and so we're working with the actual um, policymakers a bit through the Arnold Foundation. We're going to get this big data set where um, you have a bunch of different individuals and and they have you have different features of the individual. You know the crime. You know demographically what about them. You know some of the situations. You know like the arrest report. You have these features. Okay. You also know that they're African American or not. Say, and then now you you followed them for two years and you see whether there was another arrest. Okay. That's the data set. So what would be approach approach A? The obvious approach, well, we don't want to be racially biased, and so Z is an indicator of African American. Let's just throw out Z and predict just based on the other features. Uh, sorry, yeah. so you mean that the features are biased, or the way the data set that you produce is biased? I'm just saying we have a data set that would be just a nat natural data set of people going through the criminal process system. And we get features on the individuals, including African American, and then we see whether they commit another crime in the next two years. Okay, I haven't said anything about bias yet, but you can imagine that one of the indicators is African American, and then there's another set of features on, on those individuals. Um, if you remove African American, it doesn't re it, it's going to still systematically predict differently in African Americans and whites. And one reason you could imagine was, well, if I just remove African American, the other features might be things that t can perfectly tell me that they're African American. And so removing African American have, may, may have no effect at all on fairness. And, and by fairness, we would, um, there's been conflicting definitions. There's a literature on these things. So I didn't want to get into the, all the references and everything. But, but we, we, we would like to be, um, if there's two people that are identical on their features other than African American, we would certainly like them to, to predict the same. And we would like to look, like among the group, we would like them, the, 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 the predicted distributions to be the same. I'll, I'll, I'll show you. OK, so, um, so what we would like to do is take the other features, A, we have a bunch of other features, and remove the influence of Z. So we would like to remove the ability, the information con of, about race contained in A. OK, so just kind of make, make A tilde like orthogonal to Z, not, not contain information about Z. And then those cleansed A tildes could be put in anything, random forest or deep learning or whatever, and it would be fair. That's the kind of thought anyway. And so we, we have just a super simple idea, which is to take like a principal components type of thing that can, that can also scale up to, to large numbers of features, if you have those. Um, and you take a data matrix A, and then you, you, you take a cleansed A tilde, um, losing as little information about the original matrix A as possible, but then being uh, nearly orthogonal to Z, the race indicator. Um, and so then you can get a, um, yeah, you get an A tilde. And then the nice thing is that then people later on, we can just provide this cleansed data set and anyone can apply their, whatever their favorite machine learning algorithm is to the, the de-biased or cleansed data. OK, so we tried this out um, for some preliminary version of the data. We're going to get this amazing data set, but it's wrapped up with the lawyers right now, so, which it has been for quite some time. Um, so we'd like to, we're looking particularly at, at bail decisions and uh, looking at risk of recidivism. Because in setting bail, you're, you're, if you let, set the bail to an unreasonable amount, then the individual is not going to be able to set bail, and they're going to be sitting in jail until their trial. Okay. 
But if they're, if, they're low, if they're reasonably low risk of committing a crime, then it'd be better to l let them out um, until the trial. Okay, so that's the game. Um, and so there was a, uh, there's this nice ProPublica data set from 2016 where they were, they were testing the different um, tools for, for fair um, setting of bail. So um, one thing we're worried about in the data is that even if um, you, you could think like, um, well, blacks tend to be stopped more in the US and minority neighborhoods are certainly patrolled more. And so if you're, if, if, if you're African American, um, even if you're doing that, like if you had a, a, a set of white guys and a set of African American guys and they're doing the same crimes, the same distribution of crimes, and then you apply this arrest process to this, the, the arrest process is biased, it's definitely biased. You're gonna end up getting more African Americans in the criminal justice system. Yeah, okay. I mean, this is particularly true, I think, for drug crimes, because people will go into these minority neighborhoods in the US and they'll be looking for, oh, let's stop this guy. Oh, he's got some marijuana in a place where marijuana is not legal, okay? And then you arrest them. So um, maybe if they're a mur murder, it's more, less clear. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, so there's a, a selection bias. So we used this data set um, and we, we trained our, our cleansing algorithm, sanitizing the data. And here's what happened, okay? So, um, so here's the original data. So what is this? This is the distribution of out of sample predictions for the probability of recidivism. So for each individual, in our, in our data set out of sample, we have a predicted probability that they're gonna commit a crime in the next two year, within two years, okay? Um, and so we just took the original data and, and, and looked at that distribution. And so um, the Caucasians are tan and orange and blue. Okay, so the, you can see that the, the African Americans have this shifted, they're kind of completely stochastic lured and have a much higher uh, risk of recidivism without uh, removing without removing race, just taking the original features, including race. If we remove race, it has almost no impact because the other features can perfectly predict race, okay? Um, if we do our thing, um, it, re it basically removes the gap entirely, okay? Um, and, so then you, um, and so then the question is, well, what are we losing? This is the ma most amazing thing to me is that, well, okay, yeah, you, re you remove race and you've made it fair but now you're going to not do as well at predicting recidivism. That's actually not really true. So the, um, the out of sample predictive performance was, was, was similar. And so, um, so the AUC in the original case, what, um, using all the information about African American was 0.72, and if we removed, we sanitized, it went down to 0.71, which is not even statistically significantly different. So amazingly, by, by cleansing the data, removing the influence of African American, you can do just as well um, in terms of prediction. Yes? I'm just wondering how well known um, are these results among the policy community at this point, or is it still quite new? Because I mean, I think it's been quite contentious. And so Christiane, um, spend, um, who you know, obviously, um, she spends a lot of time kind of going and talking to people, policymakers. And we're the, we're the sort of nerds behind the scenes at this point, like James and I and, and Emmanuel who have been working on this um, through this grant. And so she, um, she even had a case which was amazing where she's sitting up there and there's some big sheriff who's like calling her, he kept calling her Miss California. <laughs> and she's like arguing for this kind of fair predictive algorithms using these instead of these kind of these other approaches. And he, he was just like belittling her um, through this kind of Miss California thing. So it's kind of bizarre, but she's been, kind of fighting the hard fight in that, that respect. But. Just because it seems to me like if you have an algorithm that you can use to de-racially bias your data and you have virtually no loss in predictive performance, then you have a very strong argument. You can yes, I think so, yeah. I mean, maybe in other cases there's more of a gap, but, um, and you can imagine, you can imagine shrinking or something and like playing like, oh, well, I, I'm not willing to sacrifice that much in terms of predictive performance and there's some trade-off there. But, and here there's really no trade-off. Yeah, I think it's quite compelling. Yeah. I mean, because the argument you could make is that if you use this, you reduce your likelihood of getting sued by people like the ACLU, for example. So it's a potentially, I think. I think it's compelling, yeah. I think it's compelling. Um, okay, so. Um, 
kind of running out of time ish, but we have the, I have this other cool example, maybe not, not quite as cool, but I think it's, it's cool. Um, okay, so the, we're, we're looking at these brain connectomes, and here's some more pictures. And so this is like an individual, like from the side, their brain connectome. And so each one of you has a different little picture like that. It's cool, it's really cool. Um, and so we could call that, for individual I, we could call it XI. Um, okay, so we could represent this, this complicated object in different ways. We can't just throw this at some black box. Is one, one of my points here is that in science, you need to have kind of targeted methods. Um, and so one simple way to represent it is to break the brain into a bunch of chunks. And then you could look at, well, for each pair of chunks, the number of connections or some summary of connections between the chunks, between the regions. And then you're turning this complicated thing into a matrix or a tensor if there's more than one feature of, the ch of, of, of each pair. Um, and so a simple way to do that would be, well, if xi uv is 1, that would be if there's any connection between regions u and v in individual i. And then we just have like a binary adjacency matrix or a graph or network structured um, data. Okay. Um, and so we'd like to uh, relate x to the phenotypes or outcome variables y in an in interpretable manner is the kind of goal. Um, and um, you know, one thing that we could do is we could like, well, this right here, this is kind of a super low font, but this is a low creative, you, we gave a bunch of su subjects in the study a creative reasoning test, okay? And then we took a, a bunch of individuals who took, did, did, had a low creative reasoning score and a bunch who had a high creative reasoning score, and I'm gonna kind of show the results for analyzing the differences in the brain connectome. And this is just a picture for one of these kind of individuals with a low creativity score. Um, and we could imagine, well, now we want a model for characterizing the variation in brain connectomes. And so this is individualized brain connectome. It's drawn from some distribution P. I don't know what P is. Maybe P also depends on other factors. Maybe P relates to some phenotype. OK, so we, we can write down a little statistical model. Don't worry about the details. But we can write down a model for this kind of connectome object in a, a simple way that's um, that's, that's reducing the individual to some feature vector theta i, which is drawn from some q. That's going to induce a distribution p on um, describing variation among individuals in their connectome. And we can use this kind of Bayesian nonparametric machinery to allow q and then p, um, the, the distribution of people's brains, uh, to be unknown. And one nice thing about uh, the, this kind of Bayesian formalism is that we're allowing for uncertainty in doing all of this. And so we could do things like hypothesis testing and, and testing of structure and, and do, um, get some interpretable results, et cetera. Um, OK, so we can, we can test for relationships between brain structure and things like Alzheimer's disease or creative reasoning or IQ. Um, and then we can, we can show exactly how the brain differs while allowing uncertainty quantification. And so I'll just kind of skip to the, um, the, some of the results. But um, here, 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 here are some of the results for the creative reasoning test. And so, um, so, so we, we could estimate the probability that there's any difference in the distribution of people's brains with creative reasoning. The creative reasoning score is 0.995. That's the posterior probability. So, um, so what does that mean? That means that. There's two groups of people. The one group of people have low creative reasoning. The other group of people have high creative reasoning. Each of those two groups of people have variation. There's variation among those groups of people. The distributions are not the same. We can test that. Okay? And we can also identify which links in the network are different, significantly different, adjusting for multiple comparisons between the two groups. And so a, a green edge would mean that that people with, um, with, with low creativity have um, less connections, or high creativity have, have more connections. Okay. And so um, what we found, these green edges are saying that, that highly creative individuals have significantly more inner hemispheric connections. Okay. So that's the kind of bottom line of, of that analysis. And what was cool is we, we had sort of a press release on this, and. Um, there, you have, everyone's heard, probably heard of this left hand, right hand, um, handed hypothesis. So if you're, if you're a right brain, left brain, and so if you're, if you're right brain, you're more creative, and if you're left brain, you're more analytical or mathematical. Um, and so the, 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 that guy who came up with that, who's famous for that uh, left brain, right, uh, right brain hypothesis, 
he's, he's deceased now, but his son actually contacted us and said, well, actually, this is much, he hated that hypothesis later on, and he was like really annoyed. He thought it was more um, inter, across hemispheric connections um, in, indicating creati creativity and not this left brain, right brain. So left brain, you could, if it was, le say, right brain, then, oh, in the right brain, we would see lots of more connections, so lots of green edges here, but it's actually more connections in, um, across hemispheres that's in, in our data and it's consistent with other data indicating more, more creative individuals. It's consistent with other studies. Um, so my other example, and then I'm done, we also did the same thing for Alzheimer's disease. We looked at, at, at subjects with Alzheimer's disease and age match controls. Um, and you know, the, the probability that the connectome was different in, in, across the normal aging versus Alzheimer's disease was 99%. Um, and Alzheimer's disease, people had less interhemisphere hemispheric links in the left hemisphere, but there's a, re a lot of reductions. And so I can kind of show that it's like, remember the last one was green because my, my, my high level was highly creative. And so they had more connections. Now my higher level is, is Alzheimer's disease. And so the people with Alzheimer's disease have massively less connections in all sorts of different places. Okay, this is what we, what we found. And it would be really cool to be able to get a data set where it was like people who were very early onset and see if you could use something like this to kind of figure out um, early on what's going on. But you can see that unlike a lot of machine learning algorithms, the, 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 it, it gives you um, uncertainty quantification gives you sort of testing, it gives you kind of mechanistic insight about where in the brain are these connections decreasing or increasing with this disease. Okay, so I'll just wrap up there. And so um, I gave kind of a brief biased overview of techniques in machine learning, focusing a bit on deep learning and this whole um, hype about artificial intelligence. Um, and, and these methods are amazing in the setting in which they're designed for, which is really mostly tech applications. Um, they're very limited when you go beyond that to trying to use them for science and po or policy. In those settings, you have to be very, very, very careful and think about issues like selection bias and how, how, the, the, how the algorithm is going to be used, um, where the data come from, or, or you can run into disasters. So you have to very carefully think about that, that and develop targeted methods, I think. Um, and so I gave, gave some illustrations. I'll just wrap up with an acknowledgement. I, I think. Um, for the fairness, uh, Christian is like the goddess in this area, and she got, got me working on that. Um, and, and then James and Emmanuel, we're this sort of team working on this kind of fairness through this Arnold Grant. And Daniele is the brain connectome uh, guru who, who worked with me, who's now at, 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 on, on the faculty of Bocconi in Italy. And here's just some of the um, references. I'll stop there. <laughs>